Ali, and this is Winter Queen. Let's get right into it. All right, so in the news this week, um, turns out that My Hero Academia and Full Metal Panic Invisible Victory are both getting simul dubs offered on Amazon. Really? So apparently those uh, those are becoming available as they air. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess Funimation probably has a deal with them, because I know Funimation does it for My Hero Academia yes. on their website, but yes. I'm surprised they're doing it on, on uh, Amazon as well. Yeah, well, apparently Amazon's getting quite a big anime uh, collection for what they can oh, watch they on Prime. they really do. I've watched several shows this season on Amazon um, as I mean, well. So. Yeah, we, we watched, uh, let's see, it was um, uh, Made in Abyss we've watched on Amazon, and what was that one with the uh, the steampunk train oh, zombies? Um, um, Kaibane of the Iron Fortress. Kaibaneri, Ka- Kaibaneri of the Iron Fortress. Yes. Yeah. So those mm-hmm. were those were Amazon exclusives. So mm-hmm. so uh, it looks like uh, Funimation's just branching out and trying to get as many people to watch their stuff as possible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, cool. Um. So next up, uh, this week, uh, Attack on Titan Chapter One Hundred Five was released uh, yes. in English. In English. Uh, it's up on Crunchyroll right now. For those of you who have the Crunchyroll uh, subscription, I know that I do. Okay. Um, yeah, I read it. Not going to give you guys any spoilers, but... Uh, but it's progressing along, and it's taking directions I wasn't expecting. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely something that Attack on Titan's pretty good at, taking directions you're not expecting, whether they're good or bad. Mm. We're not going to get into that right here. Uh, next up, though, we've got some news from Nintendo. Uh, yes, uh, Nintendo put out a uh, a uh, help wanted and now hiring sign on their website for um, new level designers for the Legend of Zelda series. So apparently they're going and doing mass hirings for this. Okay. Um, based out of Kyoto, so they're not... Uh, well, that's their home headquarters that, is in their, Kyoto, so... So... That seems to be what's going on there. So, it looks like they're gearing up for some something pretty big. Yeah, that's exciting. I don't know if it's a uh, new handheld Zelda for the 3DS. Um, I absolutely loved um, A Link Between Worlds. I played through that game several times. Mm-hmm. Um, well, whatever, but, more Zelda but, is always good in my book. But hiring level designers, like, mm-hmm. in mass, is what it seems to me. Sounds like they might be gearing up for something a bit, maybe, like online or continuous, like Breath of the Wild. Is they're 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 venturing back into expansive worlds with content everywhere, yeah. mm-hmm. and so it's possible that they're gearing up for something even more expansive than Breath of the Wild. Maybe I don't know. What I, as long as Nintendo takes their time and makes it right, I'm more than willing to uh, play some more Zelda. Yeah. Okay, and then next up, uh, we've got uh, just this weekend, uh, Dark Souls Remastered uh, is going to get uh, network stress testing. Dark Souls Remastered is being released later on this month, so yeah. this makes sense. They're going to go ahead and do the network stress testing. Yeah, they're remastering the, the original this weekend. They're remastering the original for uh, for the new consoles. And I've got it pre-ordered for the PS4. I was thinking about <laughs> getting it for the Switch because it would be cool to play that game on the go, but at the same time. One, if I get frustrated, it's a lot cheaper to replace a PS4 controller than it is to replace a Switch. Um, and <laughs> oh, two, rage quits. And two, I've already got Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, all on the PS4. Yeah, so, so might as well just do Might that. as well just get it for the PS4 as well. May as well. So, um, and then the a little bit um, news for you Destiny fans out there. Uh you're probably already aware of this if you are a Destiny fan, but uh, the second batch of Destiny 2 DLC just came out yesterday. Um, and um, you can go ahead, like, you were able to preload it like you do with a lot of stuff these mm-hmm. days, and people are already playing it. So Alrighty. the reviews seem to be mixed about it. Some people really like it, some people really don't. Personally, I'm still not... I never finished uh, Curse of Osiris. Right. I just... I didn't care. Other things came out, and I just got pulled into that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and just, like, I'm still playing Monster Hunter, and there's absolutely nothing that's pulling me away from that right now. Except yeah. for the multiplayer... Um, I was about to say Harvest Moon, and I apologize for it. It's not Harvest Moon. Right. Uh, the multiplayer beta for Stardew Valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been playing that a little bit with some friends. So, yeah, and then there's a little bit of news that I discovered on the way over here. Do um, tell. 
I not really discovered. I mean, I learned about it the other day when Blizzard announced it. But since I'm not an Overwatch player, I really wasn't going to talk about it. But since we're kind of an anime podcast, uh-huh. I decided to go ahead and bring it up. Blizzard, to uh, raise money for breast cancer research, mm-hmm. has released a magical girl skin for Mercy. You're kidding. Here's a picture of it. Okay. It's $15. Uh-huh. Anybody can just buy it in the store. It, it, it reminds me a bit of Devil Hunter Yoko. Yeah, it does a little bit. But she's got the twin tails, and apparently they've changed all of her sound effects and added like sparkles and things to her moves. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she, so uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, have it doesn't have her signature symbol. The, what Devil Hunter Yoko's signature symbol on the mm-hmm. chest, but it, but just the way that it's like four, um, mm-hmm. four tailed, uh, a, a four part split dress at the bottom. Mm-hmm. That's what reminds me of it, and, and oh, the red. Okay, okay, but uh, anyways, she. Um, uh, $15 to buy the skin, uh-huh. which is, some people may think it's a bit pricey, but 100% of the proceeds of it is going to breast cancer research. That's fantastic. Um, and the skin is only available for purchase for a limited time. Once you buy it, you will always have it, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, available until May 21st. Mm-hmm. You can get the skin until then. Yeah. Um, some, so, some time ago, but anyways, I watched... I brought this up just yeah. because... There's a ton of fan art already for Magical Girl Mercy. I mean, oh, of she's course officially there is. she's officially Pink Mercy, uh-huh. but everyone just calls her Magical Girl Mercy. So there it is. Yep. Yeah, I was just uh, I was just remembering um, there was a video put out by uh, Extra Credits not too long ago that was in defense of uh, additional game monetization. Basically, how the industry is bit at a bit of a standstill because movie tickets can still steadily rise, but games have been stuck at $60 for a very long time. And if they try raising the price on that, the games will stop selling, but the cost of making games is still, is ever increasing. Yeah. So, yeah. so finding ways of at least making what you mm-hmm. spent back has become harder and harder. And it's, and it's not easy because you know, you, you come up mm-hmm. with something that seems like a good idea and then, it completely backfires mm-hmm. because of fan backlash. Mm-hmm. Because you see, it seems like you're milking people for well, more than they want to pay for a game. There's several ways that you can do it. Um, the two biggest, op- so, uh, the two biggest examples of t- uh, of loot boxes, mm-hmm. as we call them, or you know, as they're called, um, they uh, we have Battlefront Two, uh-huh. which completely exploded because pretty much game progression was locked behind, and like not just game projection progression, but getting better items and progressing your character, yeah. and even yeah, unlocking like characters. Uh, pretty much all of it was locked behind um, loot boxes right. that um, would, you could get for free, but in order to get them for free, it was an absurd amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and someone once calculated it out. There was like several. I'm gonna get the number wrong since it's been forever since I read the article, but it was I think it was I think it was about a hundred thousand hours mm-hmm. to unlock everything in the game, um, just by playing without paying any money. Yeah. Um, and and that's on top of it being a sixty dollar game. Yeah. Um, whereas Overwatch, um, Overwatch does loot boxes, and you never hear people complain about it because. Because it doesn't break the game. It doesn't break the game. Loot boxes. It's not pay to win. It's one hundred percent cosmetic items. Yeah. Um, and Blizzard has proven that people are totally fine with that. Because in... Um, so, so, someone, because uh, in, part, you, in part, you know that you're supporting the creators. Mm-hmm. And that, um, that you know, when, when you buy this cosmetic material, nobody is getting an advantage over you. If, mm-hmm. you, if they buy it and you don't. Well, but, yeah, al- but also... That if you choose to buy it, it's going to a good, mm-hmm. it's going to a good developer. Well, there's no, there's actually, there's no, absolutely no character progression. I'm pretty sure there's leveling and stuff. I'm not an Overwatch player, um, right? But that just shows like your skill as a player, and it will match you against players of similar level and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I've seen. I'm pretty sure I've read about that. But anyways, yeah. um, with Overwatch, they um. You know, the skill set you start with with that character is the skill set you end with with that character. Mm-hmm. You never get to tweak it, never get to add anything to it. Yeah. It doesn't advance and get stronger. It's always the exact same. Right. It's a um, bit like Smash Brothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, they're bouts against each other. They're longer. They're a bit more involved. But you have you pick your character mm-hmm. based on what they can do. And you end up in uh, battles with uh, 
um, a motif or mm-hmm. a goal. Mm-hmm. You, get, you know, you capture the flag, you get the most kills, your standard first-person mm-hmm. shooter stuff. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. So, Blizzard yeah. has shown that, you know... Well, that, that, let's not get into it, but those are two major ways of doing loot boxes. Right. Um, that are still on a lot of gamers' minds. Anyways. And, and, and you know, DLC and other things where it, it's best if you can produce a game where all the con where enough content's there that it's a whole game mm-hmm. but dlc to make it a game and a half two games more than that but that so also brings up a lot of other things like dlc that's already on the disc and you just pretty much pay for a four kilobyte piece of data to unlock it and stuff like that yeah that's no good yeah but anyways like i said that's a whole can of worms and we're not going to get into that let's go right. ahead and get to the meat of our program uh, now that we've kind of finished, wrapped up the news, um, let's go into three episodes in. And this week it was your choice for an anime. And what anime did you pick again? I picked Megalobox. Megalobox. Mm-hmm. And wow, what a show it's been so far. It is well done. It is a beautiful piece of work. Mm-hmm. They've got... Uh, the art is reminiscent of the older style of anime, mm-hmm. but keeps up with mo- more modern mm-hmm. techniques for the animation. Uh, for the uh, well, you know why it looks like an older anime. I think you mentioned something. Tell me what it was. Um, the reason this show is even being made, it's even out, is because it's part of a celebration of the fiftieth anniversary of Ashita no Jo, which is um. I don't even know if it's come to the States, but it was a very, very big show in Japan mm-hmm. um, about a boxer. Okay. And so it was a classic boxing anime mm-hmm. uh, or manga that became an anime and then a feature film and things like that. Nice. Um, and it's the 50th anniversary. And this is part of the 50th anniversary celebration of Ashita no Joe. Okay. Uh, which, is, uh, which is, you know, something else we'll go into later on. But uh, it's, it's a... V- beautiful throwback to old school animation uh with the new techniques in its animation style yes uh the music reminds me very very much of a samurai shampoo yes it's got uh the hip-hop uh soundtrack going along with it um it reminded me of that uh that old um one one track reminded me of that uh anime music video that uh that beautifully done uh tainted donuts the cross (laughs) between um uh, they, they did a cross between Cowboy Bebop and uh, Trigun mm-hmm. with this AMV. Where Spike and Jet were hunting down. Vash the Stampede. Vash the Stampede, yep. Yes. And then uh, ended up having to use tainted donuts in order to trap him. And it was it's just a funny little video. And the music of it reminded me of one of the tracks during this. Uh, okay. Specifically uh, the one where um, he's... There's a scene where he's sitting on the edge of a highway look, overlooking a city with headphones on. Mm-hmm. That track. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's that's because the song is Japanese hip-hop. Yes. So. So, there it is. Okay. Okay, so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so this anime starts with um, a bit of a montage-ish scene where the main character is riding a motorcycle... And having flashbacks to a boxing match where he's losing. And the monologue's talking about how he's trapped in this perpetual cycle of destruction with no no way out. And what is he going to do about it? And he suddenly stops paying attention to how fast he's... It seems like he stops paying attention to how fast he's going. And then jumps his motorcycle off a cliff mm-hmm. and then freeze frames at that moment cut you're to. probably thinking how i got here <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't actually say anything like that but yeah but yeah uh so we find out very quickly that he is a professional boxer who is so good that the only thing he, that the only that he's being monetized for throwing fights. He's good enough that he will always be able to last to the point where he's supposed to throw the fight. 
I wouldn't say professional boxer simply because we well, see he's very, under, very clean. Yeah. He's an under he's an underground fighter. I I, I mm. if I said he gets professional, paid for his money, I know that's what, yeah. I know that's what you mean. But there's two very very different worlds in this that they established very yes. early on. There's a very very rich, sleek, futuristic looking world, uh-huh. and then there are the slums, and that's where Junk Dog, our main character, lives. Yes, he is. A, he's in the slums, and we learn that um, coming up is this tournament that there. I um, yes, the, this. The this uh, what was her name? Uh, Yukiko. We then we're introduced to uh, oh, so at some point he's watching TV and Yukiko's doing this news, uh, broadcast, uh, press press conference. She's doing a press conference announcing this upcoming tournament, um, that her company is sponsoring for the sport that these that is the main focus, the title of this anime, which is uh. Megalo boxing, where we what we have what we have is we have boxers with enhanced arms. They've got mechanical devices on their arms that enhance their punching, and they're they're supposed to be these equalizers that improve certain skill sets, and so um, it it just makes it's supposed to make boxing even more exciting. Mm. And there are two worlds. There's the underground fight club, uh, mafia run gambling, and then mm-hmm. there is the above board professional um, tournament level mm-hmm. stuff. And we're introduced to um, and we're introduced to both worlds pretty much simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And so he sees um, this, this uh, beautiful woman. Who apparently is the CEO of her own company? She's the CEO of uh, her grandfather invented the um, the gear that they use to fight, like this kind of exoskeleton yeah. that they wear in their arms and shoulders that right. increases the power of their punches. Right. And so she's a uh, and um, she's about to mention the name of the up in, the prospective champion of this tournament when. Uh, junk turns off the TV, and we don't find out who it is yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, we of course eventually will, but at this point, it's junk doesn't care enough about profession. He doesn't care enough to know anything about any any professional boxers, mm-hmm. uh, which it makes him basically the exact opposite of uh, Deku from My Hero Academia, <clears throat> who knows everything about every hero he can. He's, our, our uh, junk is um, very focused on himself and finding a solution to his own problems and is not involved in professional level, uh, is, not as in, is not interested in who else is a professional level boxer. Mm-hmm. And so, which opens up uh, future storytelling in this show where we will get to learn about other boxers that he will end up facing through other people's point of view. Mm-hmm. So he becomes a, uh, a stand in for us as we're becoming more and more involved in a, in this world that's on, that's uh, opening up to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we find out that his trainer, a, uh, Mr. Nanbu mm-hmm. is, um, indebted to the mob. And in order to pay off the debts to the mob, he's trained Junk how to box and how to throw fights. Mm. Okay. And so, and the winnings they get by making it seem like he could win and doesn't, the winnings they get from the gambling, is going to pay off their debts. But also, because he's throwing the fights in the way that he is throwing them, it makes more money for the mob that runs the uh, the boxing matches already. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, that's what we're kind of introduced to. And he, he's, so in the very first moments, he's prom- he's acting on the promise that he received that he could fight to his best ability this time. Mm-hmm. And then his trainer, who's drunk in a bar, 
um, without any tact, lets him know things have changed, you're going to throw the match. Mm -hmm. Which is a disappointing to junk on multiple levels. One level being that the guy who repairs his stuff for him, repairs both his bike and his, uh, his gear, his gear, he advised him to bet on him that night that he was going to win the fight. And so he ends up letting him down and he's hit and he starts hating himself for being stuck in a situation where he can't fight to hit the best of his ability mm -hmm. and eventually just succumbs and throws the fight, but he's beginning angrier and angrier because of this. Mm hmm. And so he goes out, mm -hmm. driving in the rain, and ends up on a private highway that isn't even finished yet, and ends up nearly running over. Well, on, okay. on the highway that night, we see the chairman, or the chairwoman, uh, Yudi, or no, uh, no, we see the champion, Yudi, and the chairwoman, Yes, uh, talking we're, about we're not really tell. we're not really introduced to who Yuri is at this point. We just know that mm -hmm. she's talking to this guy. Yeah, and talking to him. Well, she's at this point. She's already talking to him about you know being the top fighter in the top tournament. Yes, yeah, so the, like so we're so, trying to be introduced to who mm -hmm. he is. And um, as she turns and goes to her car, Junk almost hits her with her motorcycle. Yes, and he 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 misses her. He he skids to a halt and stuff like that. He he barely misses her. He barely mm -hmm. misses her car. If you watch the skid marks, mm -hmm. and then he skids into uh, some 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 garbage, some some, gar some construction stuff. Yeah, some supp construction mm -hmm. supplies piled up on the end of the freeway. Mm -hmm. But anyways, uh, something that really struck me as neat um, is the fact that uh, Yukiko uh, isn't just the typical head of a corporation, evil person, doesn't care about people's lives and things like that. She genuinely goes over to Junk Dog and offers to help him. She yeah. turns her help away because he's still furious at the world right now. Um, he says, I don't need your help type stuff. I don't want your charity. Yeah, I don't want your charity. Um, and she's like, oh, okay. And so they go to leave. Um, and then, but he knows who they are. Yeah. He knows mm -hmm. who she is. And then he throws out in his rage, he throws out a massive insult towards the style of boxing that they engage in, mm -hmm. which sets off her companion, Yuri. Mm -hmm. And the two of them prepare to square off. Uh, it's like, Yuri insists he takes it back. He says, "What you get, uh, maybe you should teach me a lesson. Mm -hmm. And the two of them begin to square off. And then a beautiful cinematic moment happens. When Yuri... Uh, so Junk takes up his standard boxing pose. And Yuri matches him and takes up his pose. And for the briefest moment, time stops. The rain freezes in midair. As Junk realizes... This guy's a bit more serious than I think. Mm -hmm. And he likes it. Mm -hmm. And it's just this beautiful freeze frame cinematic Junk moment that happens. gets all excited about it. And it's, it's one of these moments that makes anime worth watching. Because only anime as an art form, they don't even do anything to each other. But the way the scene is Com composed it does in seconds what dragon ball z does in minutes with mm -hmm. their with their constant power-ups and look how mighty i am look how much mightier i am now look i've said it, it before does... and i'll say it again i love dragon ball z yes okay it's great dragon ball z it takes episodes for something to happen it just has episodes of build-up and then finally that build-up takes off and the build-up is so awesome that you're willing to sit through several more episodes of crap just to get to a little bit more awesome yes that's why i love dragon ball z kai i don't know if you've ever watched that one. i haven't watched kai i've started <laughs> watching super okay. with matthew well, but dragon i haven't ball watched z kai. kai is a recut of dragon ball z that cuts out all the filler uh-huh yes in episode uh, in the original original dragon ball z series i believe the episodes showed up on earth at like I think it was like episode twenty nine something like that. Yeah, 
they show up in episode eight in Dragon Ball Z Kai. Okay, <laughs> they've already cut out over twenty episodes worth of filler. Nice. It just it moves so quickly and it's so nice. good. Anyways, but um, back to this show. This show is moving mm -hmm. along at a very steady pace. Mm -hmm. So we've been introduced to our main character and his his passions and his pains. Mm -hmm. And then we're introduced to who is going to obviously be the main antagonist. Yuri, yeah. Yuri. Um, uh, trying, uh, so I, I watched this earlier today and I'm just tired. I'm trying to remember the, uh, the what, order of events. What but, happens is that they're about to fight they're and about then to fight. Yukiko calls off Yuri and Yuri goes back to the car. Yes. And Yuki and not Yukiko, um, Junk starts mocking Yuri for being the obedient dog that he is. Yes. Mm hmm Well, next day, um, Yuri is or not not uh, Junk is in the ring getting ready for the fight that he's supposed to throw. Apparently he's supposed to fight five rounds or something like that, and then at the Yeah, he's he, and he's the, supposed to throw it about halfway through the fifth round. Yes. Um <laughs> But the person that they were expecting doesn't show, mm -hmm. and Yuri does. And Yuri shows up, and everybody there recognizes who he is. But Junk. Mm -hmm. And so... Well, Junk recognizes... Junk him. recognizes him from the night before, but doesn't realize that he is who he is. He turned off the TV before he was introduced to, mm. to this, who this person was. I don't agree with you on that. I think that Junk's familiar enough with that world that he does know who Yuri is. Not once he, did he, I ever get the vibe that well, he doesn't know who Yuri no, he, is. No, the, there was an exchange between him and his trainer where he's like, who is this? I don't remember that at all. Yeah. I don't remember that exchange in the slightest. It was very quick, but it was kind of, uh -huh. the, it was a, it, it gave his trainer, uh, uh -huh. Mr. Nanbu, a mm -hmm. chance to pontificate on who Yuri is. Mm -hmm. to, give, to grant some more character exposition. It's a very quick one line of moment for him, but yeah, he, I don't think he's ever... He, he might be... Okay. Yuri, he might be, like, as famous as The Rock. Like, you know who he is, even if you've never watched a bit of wrestling. Mm -hmm. But if you... But you might not... If you don't watch him wrestling, you don't know what he can do to you. Okay. As I think... It, it, is my understanding of what, what was going on. Okay. Um, But eventually, they, get, they start fighting. Mm -hmm. And up to this point... Every bout we've seen, we've seen these mechanical attachments that look a little bit like Matt Damon in Elysium. Yeah, they're very, very external. They're, they're external got... pipes and bars and motors. And yeah, you've got, uh, you've got pistons and things that help them move their arms and stuff. And then Yuri enters the ring wearing a robe. And when he disrobes, what he's wearing looks like Jax from uh, Mortal Kombat. They are sleek, streamlined flush against his body mm -hmm. and just obviously in a class of their mm -hmm. own. Yeah. You're, you're obviously looking at go-karts <clears throat> versus Porsches. Mm -hmm. And so that was an amazing point. I'd say off-roaders versus Porsches. Because okay. they're still able to do some incredible things oh, yeah. with their... Uh, oh, no, when yeah. I say go-kart, I'm picturing Mario Kart style karts. So just the way the, mm -hmm. the, the okay. frames were built. And so, but yeah, you're right. Off-roaders is a better description. Okay. And uh, so the episode ends with Yuri revealing his arms. And then it goes into the ending credits. Mm -hmm. Which I wrote down one of my favorite things about this uh, show was the neon st neon sign style of the ending credits. Mm -hmm. Of just the very, just how very stylistically it was establishing itself. It reminded me a bit of Cowboy Bebop in the way that it's defining itself oh yeah yeah that, that's another thing i like about this is a throwback you know to older animes and things things like that yeah. um the anime you and i grew up with trigun uh cowboy bebop samurai shampoo and things like that mm -hmm. um it has a very very old school vibe to it yes it's so weird for me to say that cowboy bebop is old school but by today's standards it is by today's um, standards it is <clears throat> Um, but, the, but this one is bringing back a lot of the old flavors. Yeah, it really is. It's doing it really, really well. Um, so for older anime viewers like us, uh, it's uh, absolute, it's a gem. It's an absolute joy to watch this show so far. Yes. Um, but yeah. So, anyways, uh, 
the next episode starts and they get into the fight and yes. um and uh, junk and, and Jun- junk's teacher keeps telling him throw the match just yeah. just lie down because he's going to kill you if you don't mm-hmm. and junk says one of my favorite lines is well, Junk gets knocked down real fast, yeah. and he gets back up. He gets back up. Mm-hmm. And he gets back up, and then he says And this. then he says, well, and that's right, I'm remembering that now. He says, dying doesn't bother me when I'm having this much fun. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, Junk realizes he's in a, he's trapped in a bad situation, but and he, and he's a bit nihilistic in that he doesn't care what happens to him. He's very much living for the moment. Which is kind of exemplified by his uh, motorcycle uh, self-destructive tendencies, but he's yeah. not. But he's not suicidal. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Um, I, I don't know. Being trapped in a bad situation, I don't really know if I agree with that take on it. But yeah, no, he he, he, he uh, wants something more, and he doesn't see a way to get it. And well, so well if, if, if we're talking about just his life in general, then yes. Yes. I thought you were talking about just this fight. No, his okay, life in general. Okay, okay, And so this fight awakens up something in him that he doesn't care if he dies fighting in this because of how much he's going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And he does. He does yeah. absolutely enjoy it, even though Yuri starts bragging on him and says, Here, how about I give you a... A uh, handicap. A handicap. And he only uses his left arm. Um, and this part's a bit cliche, but he, like, he takes junk out with just his left arm for a little bit and then junk gets back up and then he says the line type thing and then they get into a fight and junk comes in for a couple of surprise attacks and eventually he forces yuri to use his His right right arm if he didn't Mm -hmm. use his right arm he would have been knocked out Mm mm-hmm Yep, and then Junk says, Junk pretty much says that like, I, I, uh, how about you stop playing around and let's do this seriously now? And Yuri's like, okay, and just proceeds to destroy Junk. Yes, <laughs> Junk doesn't stand a chance after that point. No. Um. But uh, yeah, Yuri yeah. goes off after they after a count of ten. And junk gets a round one KO. Yeah. Um, and as he's leaving, Junk gets back up and he starts saying, "Hey, this fight isn't over. Get back in here and let's fight some more." Well, everyone's like, you're crazy. He just decimated you. Not only did you, not only did you lose, you lost for a 10 count. The fight is over. Yeah. You're now asking for another different fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and something I'm really loving about the whole point, like, they did this right here. They, they started, they introduced the fight at the climax of episode one to get you to watch episode two. And episode two really establishes the differences between our hero and our mm-hmm. antagonist. And so we know... We know what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to a fight where Junk is on par with this guy. Mm-hmm. And the question is, and the question the rest of the show is going to answer is, what is the path he's going to take to get there? Mm-hmm. Well, and that's something that a lot of shonen anime uh, fails at. And mm-hmm. um, Gigguk, I think that's how we yeah. pronounce his name. Gigguk. He's got this great show about the ceiling level of power in anime. Yeah. Um, and My Hero Academia one of the reasons it's doing so incredibly well is because it established very, very early on that um, All Might is the most powerful hero. Yeah, he's the ceiling. He is the ceiling. And they've introduced villains who are trying to beat him. And then they've introduced mm -hmm. the main character who can reach that ceiling at some point and possibly exceed it by some levels. Well, he says in the very first episode, this is a story about how he became the world's mightiest hero, or the world's strongest hero. Yeah, he says that by episode three. We don't know that yet. No, I think No, I I I I rewatched it. Was it episode three? It wasn't until after he was... It was... I think it might have been the end of episode two. But it wasn't until after All Might offered the... uh, To give him his powers. That he says, oh, by the way, this is the story about how I became the greatest hero. I could have sworn that was episode one. Anyways. No, I'm pretty sure it happens at the end of episode two. Okay. But anyways. um, uh, Whereas other show, and and One Piece, we know what the ceiling is. We know what the goal is. Luffy has to be more powerful than the four emperors Mm -hmm. in order to become the pirate king. Right. Um, and uh, we also know what the end goal is. Mm-hmm. He wants to be the Pirate King, and he has to yes. get to One Piece to get there. Yes. As opposed to Naruto. Naruto and Bleach, which have Bleach, the problem they of they just have stronger and stronger guys. Yep, it just kept it falls more into, more... Mm-hmm. falls into the Dragon Ball Z trap. Yep, where they, like, even like even with Dragon Ball, you know, Dragon Ball just had the Dragon Balls, and they would just go on adventures to get them, mm-hmm. whereas all that fell apart in Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, that so, it became the 
uh, the, the, the big bad of the season, who is mm-hmm. a million times stronger than the last big bad. And so they're just the power. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> power That's... scales has got worse and worse. Yep. Um, but yeah, and it's but they've it's, established it's constantly, trying to, it's tr- it. constantly trying to outdo itself yes and eventually you just lose interest because the characters become so powerful you're just like what are they doing you know why yeah. are they wasting their times with, with their time with crap like this yeah um and, and the problem with those sort of things is that you end up losing pacing as you try to establish how powerful the characters are mm-hmm. and you have to keep on and, and you waste so much time introducing new characters anyways that's a that's and, a, that's, and, and that's not not a problem this show seems that it's going to have this show introduces characters in a very tight concise manner mm-hmm. and gives them a purpose for existing and it, within the context of the show and uh Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, uh, this looks like the show's going to avoid that pitfall entirely. Yeah, it's no, doing I agree. Right. I agree with you on this. I think the show's going to avoid that. I think it's going to be like with that My Hero Academia, mm-hmm. where it's got the um, it's got we got the power, power ceiling. ceiling. We've got mm-hmm. the goal. We got the target. His his way. goal is to defeat Yuri. Is what yes. he wants to do. He wants to beat Yuri on his own mm-hmm. terms in his ring. Yep. Which again brings us back to the soundtrack of the show, which is just so far it's been incredible. I'm not a big fan of hip hop. But in this show, it works. It works incredibly well. Yeah. Just because it has kind of that punk. I know hip-hop and punk are not the same thing. I get it. I know that. But at the same time, this show has a very punk-esque feel to it. Yeah. And hip-hop t- really, really, like... Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's about... It, it's... Oh, what, what, what's, the word, what's the phrase I'm trying to... It has an essence of the themes of Slumdog Millionaire. Mm-hmm. Where you have, you have your ghetto kid. Mm-hmm. And um, Battle Angel Attila had the same thing going for it, mm-hmm. where you have you have your ghetto character, mm-hmm. and they have to struggle against the establishment. Mm-hmm. And so, and so, yeah, uh, hip hop was born from the ghettos, mm-hmm. and so it, it, so that flavor it, it, it is enriched by that mm-hmm. that nature and that environment. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, if they like, jazz was born in the South. Mm-hmm. Hip hop was born in on the street. Yeah. So. But uh, and that, so that's and so mm-hmm. that's where it's getting that flavor from. But after that match, um, something's just changed in JD and Junk Dog and Junk Dog, and he does not want to lose anymore. You know, he yes. he's sick of this, and he's brought in for the next fight and uh throughout the entire series or not the, well, the entire uh, series up to every this point. fight we've seen up to this point he's worn an earpiece for his manager um hanbu to uh tell him or not n- not hanbu shoot what's his name again nanbu nanbu there you go nanbu san mm-hmm. nanbu um able to tell you know walk him through stuff give him advice and things like that mm-hmm. And he's t- and in this fight, uh, he's talking to uh, to JD, and uh, Nambu- Nambu's just like, "What? Well, he's not listening. Why aren't you listening to me, kid? What the crap's going on?" And he turns, he notices that uh, that he's JD's not, wearing, not wearing the earpiece, not wearing the earpiece, and he's supposed to go th- three rounds, something like that, with this guy. Yeah. And uh, this other guy's just being all cocky and like showing off his moves and stuff like that. And the bell rings, and JD just walks right up to him. And the guy gets more and more afraid as JD's walking up to him. And then in a single punch, the very first punch, JD knocks the guy out. One punch KO. Mm -hmm. Just out like a light. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's just him saying, I'm not doing this anymore. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Which leads to consequences that he may or may not have been completely aware of. As it leads to... The soup scene. Tell mm-hmm. us about the soup scene. Okay, so. Let me finish this piece of ice I just put in my mouth. All right. Mm. So. Nanbu has debt. And yes. he's been using his winnings to pay off the interest for the debt. Yes. And that just shows how much interest and how much debt he has. Right. Um, and um, he gets taken by some thugs... Uh, and uh, JD is out in kind of a waiting room waiting for Nambu, mm-hmm. and we see Nambu in a kitchen. Yeah. And a man in a very, very nice three-piece suit is cooking in this kitchen. Yes, he is. 
Um, and in the background, you suddenly start hearing hearing screaming. It's in it, another it is, room. It is the muffled screams of a person being assaulted while wearing some kind of gag. Mm. It is the is the sound you're hearing? Yep. Uh, it only takes a couple of these screams before Nanbu then Nambu falls to the down. floor. Well, not just, he doesn't fall to the floor. Oh. He gets down on his knees and he goes very, very prone, the most polite bow possible in, in Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. um, begging for forgiveness, saying that this is a one-time thing, it's never going to happen again. Please, please don't kill me. Um, and as he's, and he stops begging for his life, um, real fast, though, one of my favorite things about this scene mm -hmm. is the screaming in the background. Because yeah. the best way to scare people is to not show them what's going on. Oh, it's so true. It works so well to show them, to scare them by not what, to show them not, you know, to not show them what's going on. Yeah. And that's exactly how they get to Nambu. It's such a great way of getting to him. And anyways, um, this man, turns out his name is a Fujimaki, and he mm. is the crime boss of the area. Yes, he is. And he starts talking about, I didn't write down the name of the dish, but it's a certain type of dish that uses 100% of the animal. They turn it into a soup. Yeah. And he says... You take a 300 gram, or like you... Like a 500 a, gram a 500 bone. gram bone, and you get 500 grams worth of this soup. Mm -hmm. And as he ladles it into a bowl, he hands it over to Nambu and says, How much do you weigh? He just went over the calculations of what, of what the ratio of meat to soup he can produce, and then asks him his measurements. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nambu drinks the soup and, again, bows and begs for forgiveness. With the intensity that his head hits? As I was about to say, his head hits the corner of the table that he's bowing towards, and it leaves a trail of blood. He yes. hit it so hard he cracked his own skull. Now, they're in a professional soup kitchen, so there's stainless steel everywhere mm -hmm. and so he hit his head on a stainless steel table mm -hmm. and broke it open mm -hmm. well didn't well, break his skull okay. but broke the skin at least. gave himself mm -hmm. a flesh wound mm -hmm. on the edge of a table from bowing mm -hmm. and uh nambu gets so desperate that he actually offers to sell um jd yeah to them to help him get out of his debt um and the guy's just like, well, uh, we can go ahead and do that. Uh, you're a desperate little pig. But um, I'm going to, it's going to cost you your other eye. Yes. Up, mm -hmm. So something we and haven't he mentioned. Hands, and he tosses him a knife, uh, telling, telling him that he needs to cut out his own eye. Yes. Uh, which, now uh, that brings up his character design. He already has an eye missing. He is wearing an eye patch this whole time. Um, and so, being told to cut out his remaining eye... Would make him completely blind. So, yeah. Yep, anyways, um, he then, uh... Well, bef before this all happened, we should probably jump back to the before the fight. JD talks to Nambu and says that we need, you know, I'm done with this, mm -hmm. I want you to get me into this. And he hands him a poster for the fighting tournament mm -hmm. that's happening in the city. Well, it's not possible for them to join because they're not citizens. Right. And citizens have ID badges. It's very much, um, oh gosh, it's very, very, um, dystopian, mm. um, cyberpunk-esque yes. that they do, um, uh, where they talk about these IDs. Um, it's a, it's, um, the thing that I kind of want to liken it to or compare it to is, um, is, uh, Sin. From uh, Shadowrun. Shadowrun is a tabletop RPG. Okay. Um, and there is uh, something in the world called Sin, which is um, social identification number. Mm. Um, and everybody has a Sin, unless you're a Shadowrunner. You have the option to not, and you're called a you're either a Sinner mm -hmm. or a Sinless. Mm. And a Sinner, somebody who has one of those IDs. They're part of society, you know, they pay their taxes, they go to work, they work at the company store, buy clothes at the company, uh, at, or, they, or they work at the company offices, they buy clothes at the company store, buy their food at the company company grocery stores, and as, you know, so mega corporations run the world in shower and stuff like that, so. 
Are you buying clothes at the soup store? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, so it's something like that where you, if you do yeah. not have one of those numbers, you cannot be part a part of society. Right, and that's what they kind of do in this world. You have to have a license. You have to have. Uh, you have to be a citizen in order to participate in this tournament. Yes, and that. Uh, um, uh, going back to um, how they're doing uh, aesthetics. Well, real uh, fast, let me finish this. Like, like, it's, me... it's a distinct difference between. Um, how shiny and clean the city is versus how third world mm-hmm. the slums are. Mm-hmm. And it's night and day. Yeah. And so they've established this. Mm-hmm. But um, going back to the IDs, uh, well, going back to that, um, one of the reasons that Namba says no is because, or Nambu says no, is because you know, you're not a citizen. None of us are citizens. Yeah. There's no way you can participate. Now, let's just go ahead and go and do this fight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he throw, he refuses to throw the fight. He beats the guy in a single punch. Um, anyways. Causes um, this problem. They go to the soup store. He then has an idea where he doesn't want to, um, in order to not cut out his eye, he pulls out the flyer that was given to him by JD. Yeah. And he slaps it down on the table and says... Help us participate in this tournament, and we will win the tournament, and I will be able to pay you back every single dime that I owe you with the winnings. And the guy agrees to it, because he's interested in this prospect. Mm -hmm. Um, And he... um, He sees some value in it. mm -hmm. That maybe he'll win, but if they don't, they'll still owe him. And so... Mm -hmm. But even if they get so far, they might be able to pay him something. Mm -hmm. So he does see a return on an investment if he helps Mm -hmm. them. But anyways, he helps them, gives them an ID uh, of, a, of a, we won't go into the, the story of the poor guy whose ID they got. Yes, they, they, they adopted the idea ID of a poor unfortunate said, soul. I said, okay. <laughs> I was about to say, let's not get into that. But they, and so they're changing, the, so they've got this hacker who is changing the image. That, so they have, so the ID chips are very interesting. They are translucent. They got these all these wires going in around them and, mm-hmm. in a frame. And so you don't actually see anything on the ID, but it's one of those, you put it on some other computer device and it reads an official what your ID actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, is how they've done this mm-hmm. stylistically. Um, and so they're change. so they got this guy's ID and they're going to change the photo and a bit of the information so it matches junk. Mm-hmm. And then they give him a chance to pick a name. He's like, it's your ID, It's you, pick your name. And then Junk go ahead, decides to go with the name Joe. And that's what made it click for me, because I saw that at the beginning, it had a little little title card uh-huh. in the opening credits, 50th anniversary for, you know, uh, for Joe, and it's for Ashtano Joe, Tomorrow's Joe. Uh-huh. Um, and Tomorrow's Joe actually... F- f- follows a kind of a similar pattern mm. where Joe lived in the slums and he um, he uh, got into a fight in order to protect some people and one of the people who saw this fight was a manager mm. and saw the potential in Joe okay. and turned Joe into a professional boxer. Ah. So, so this is kind of a retelling of uh, Ashton of Joe. Yes. So tomorrow's uh, Joe. And you know something's up because the moment he picks the name Joe, the music they play at that precise moment is deliberately goosebump inducing. Mm-hmm. Something like you know, even if you don't know why, you know something important just happened there. Like Joe, that is a good name. Mm-hmm. But and, and so I I want to I want to now. See if they actually pulled the theme song from the whole show. Yeah, I, I kind of want to look that up. I didn't get the chance to, but I kind of want to look that up and yeah. see if they did. Um, but anyways, um, that's the end of episode two. Right. And episode three is about them uh, signing up for the tournament. Um, kind of... A, a lot happens in episode three. A lot um, happens in all three episodes. Mm-hmm. They're very dense in the... They're, they're dense, but... Mm-hmm. But very specific in the direction mm-hmm. that the story is going. It mm-hmm. is has a lot of good momentum. Mm-hmm. One of the things I actually really liked, especially at the beginning of episode three, is we get to see Yuri's training routine, mm-hmm. where he's got this really really cool machine that will send out bars and like um, will like 
have like little laser beams and stuff from him. He's got to punch the machine. Mm-hmm. It like will send out bars behind him and stuff and over his head and things. And he needs to turn around and move and stuff and hit those uh, those uh, those yes pads. Um, and it gives him a score at the end. And as he's walking away, about to you know finish his routine for the day, he hears Joe's voice uh, prodding him on, saying, uh, "Get back in here." And that's, you, you, is that what you call your style oh, of boxing? That's right. He's like, is that what you call your style of boxing? And he just goes, <sighs> and he go turns around and goes back to yes. do another round of it. And so we know that Yuri is going to be the best he can possibly be when the final confrontation happens. Yeah, y- Yuri is not taking this lightly at all. Yes, yeah, so he got <laughs> into his head, and it's yeah. just this beautiful Joe moment. Got into like, his head, like, and, so. and Yuri's not a bad guy. No, he's he's just a champion. And it's just going to be—it's going to be so satisfying to mm-hmm. beat him, and but then again, it might not do that. He might lose to him in the final yeah. fight, the way that Rocky lost to Apollo Creed in the first Rocky mm-hmm. movie. Well, in the first Rocky movie, it was never about the boxing. So no. that Rocky was never really about the boxing; it was always about the journey. Yes. Um. But um. Yeah. So. So win or lose. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. They could go either way at the end of this series. Um. Because, you know, his, historically, either well, way could work as a story. I just want to see how it goes. Uh, no. But, um, and something that also really surprised me is Nambu actually knows his his stuff about fighting. Yes, he does. You know, he's not just this, like, we, we see well, in the beginning as... of episode three, yeah. like, he was always in the ringside, but he was always telling them when to fall and stuff like that. So, you think he's just a scam guy. But, at the beginning of episode three, other trainers and um, coaches, and they recognize him as he's going to go sign up for Joe. Yeah. And like, oh, hey, how are you doing? And like, they chat with him for a little bit. And then later on, he's training Joe. And Joe's just like, oh, come on, I don't need this. And he starts kicking Joe's butt because Joe's not taking the fight, the training seriously. Yeah, he, he so, episode three really opens up and opens up who Nanbo is. Mm-hmm. Nanbu and um, really, you know, establishes him as somebody who's taking this seriously. Like he w- he was just plodding along, getting drunk in the middle of the day, and thinking that this slow and steady day by day thing would eventually maybe he'll get out of debt from the mob. But at least as long as he's making regular payments, everything's fine. Mm-hmm. His boy's getting beat, but he can take it, and everything's fine. Oh, he can totally take it. He's yeah. way stronger than these chumps that are you know that were fighting him before yeah but now he's honestly worried for him because he's going into the real thing and the real thing you know yeah and so he's a completely different world so he sobers up and is actually focused on training him because both of their lives are on the line if they fail Mm mm-hmm but we get introduced, introduced to a couple of kid characters where yeah. these kids, they get a drug called Red Candy mm. um, given to them by a dealer if they steal stuff for them. And these kids end up helping out Joe and steal up a, steal a better suit, uh, yeah. a better gear for him, but that gear gets destroyed in a fight. So we have no idea. Yeah. And Like, the fight's just a couple of days away, so we, like the episode ends with us really not knowing how he's going to get the gear he needs to participate in his first fight and he's right. ranked he's so far ranked 257 out of 257 so there are 257 people yeah. in the tournament right now well the reason for that is he was the last one to sign up and he hasn't fought yet so they yes. just automatically mm-hmm. put him at the bottom oh, yeah. of the list i mean i'm not saying oh you know poor him that's just how it goes yeah um but yeah so we... but it is not it's not because he lost anything that he's at that point mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. just that's his starting line but yeah um I don't, I don't really think there's much else to talk about the first three episodes. I mean, it's so far it's just been incredible. I really want to see more. I really want to uh, see where this goes. I'm very, very excited about it. I'm, the, the music's great. The voice acting has been top-notch. The animation quality, even like, it's just been incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely, I give this show... A pat. I don't want to say it. no. Pass means like I'm gonna pass on it. I I like it. I like it a lot, and yeah. I want to see more of it. Maybe we should invent a grading scale for the shows that we're watching so we can give it a. Uh... Mm, no. 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 Uh, no need to. No need to Siskel and Ebert this like a two thumbs up thing. No. No need to Siskel and Ebert it, and also you know, I'm more. I don't so. want to say morally opposed to rate ratings and things like that, just because. Just because we like something, that doesn't mean the people listening to this show are going to like the same thing we like. I mean, no, but we the both point... absolutely ad- 
adore Magical Girl Orde, but it's not going to be for everybody. It isn't. It's not going to be not. for everybody. Where, but and this show, we both love this show, but it's it's there's going to be people out there who don't enjoy it. You know, so us saying, "Oh, this is great," I feel like you know it ignores well, the fact. It ignores well, that fact. Well, that's the that's half the function of a critic is that a critic is supposed to speak their mind, say what they like or don't like about something, and then you go out and try it yourself. Mm-hmm. And if you and if you tend to like the things that this critic likes, maybe you can trust their judgment. And the exact opposite. If you tend to hate the things this critic likes, you can trust their judgment and not watch the things they like mm-hmm. and watch the things they don't. So that that is the original function of a critic. Mm-hmm. Is that you you'd get to know them, get to know their... Uh, their tastes and match them against yours. Don't don't become a copy of who of the critic. Just figure out if they like what you like or if they hate what you like. And if they hate it, go watch it. Well, the original function of a critic was more of a gatekeeper to the arts. So, but anyways. But that, again, yeah, it does work as a gatekeeper, uh, sort of. Back in the day, well, these days, well, not so much. But, well. but anyways, yeah, I love the show. I think it's great. So, what are your thoughts, final thoughts on it? Um, I agree. I think the show has a lot of potential, that it's off to a roaring start. Things are going just right for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I want to watch more. Yeah, same here. All right, so next week, you get to pick. What are we watching next week? All right, so I was browsing through um, things, looking at titles of uh, what's coming down the pipeline. And something caught my eye. Um, there was an anime called Erased that caught my eye. Okay. Uh, the tagline read, Satoru Fujinuma is a young manga artist struggling to make a name for himself following his debut. But that was not the only thing in his life that Satoru was feeling frustrated about. He was also living with a strange condition only he was able to experience. Hmm. So I'm not entirely sure what it what the flavor of this anime is. It feels like it's going to be a bizarre, a slightly bizarre twist on Slice of Life. Not as, not as bizarre as say Lane was, mm-hmm. but something along those lines where there's some, something's just off enough that they would spoil it if they told you. So I'm gonna give that a, I want I want to give that a try and see what it's like because it's, the artwork looks stunning. And I want to see what uh, what the story's all about. Okay. See if that's worth it. Okay, cool. Well, so, it's, uh, so it's called Erased, and we're going to give that a try this next week. Cool. All right, we'll go ahead and watch those first three episodes. All right, okay. next up we have Recommendation of the Week. So I stumbled across this band watching videos from a previous Recommendation of the Week, which was uh, um, Horror Show Comics. One of the uh, title opening title sequences, they used a song that this band put together. Mm-hmm. And this band is called Think Up Anger. And what they do is they do covers. They, they, they do a dark and solemn covers of other music. And I looked them up. They also do uh, movie trailers. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for... so. In the same spirit as, say, um, Two Steps from Hell. Mm -hmm. But you go to Two Steps from Hell if you want something that sounds like Hans Zimmer. Mm -hmm. You go to Think Up Anger if you want something that sounds like Evanescence. Okay. And uh, the song that I listened to them was called uh, Mutiny. But it's... um, They call it Mutiny, but it's actually a cover of Crazy by Seal. Okay. And I watched, and so I watched that. I watched their song first, and then I watched the Seal song, and it is night and day between mm-hmm. what Seal performed and what these people put together, and it's just amazing. I'll link them. I'll link uh, some of their videos, and uh, so people can take a listen. Okay. Cool. All right, and that uh, brings us to the creator shout out. And this week, that's your turn. This week, it's my turn, and again, it's another YouTube artist. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a channel called Frog Leap Studios, and uh, it is a single guy, mm-hmm. and he, he'll have guest performers with him every once in a while. Um, his name is Leo. Um, I'm going to butcher his last name, so I'm not even going to try it, but he is in the the Netherlands, okay. and he does metal covers of other songs. Okay. 
and the first song of his that I ever heard was uh, Africa by Toto. Uh huh. And he did just this really, really fun, energetic metal I cover think, of it. I think I'm you've shared this. Pretty with sure me. I'm shared that I've shared that with you. Yeah, but it was uh, the video uh, that he did was just himself performing it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, it's like with, it was like a guy in his own studio performing. Yeah, it's it. like with Pompamus, where it was them playing all the instruments. And they would just take multiple, you know, recordings of them playing different instruments, and they spliced it all spliced it all together. Okay. And then he brought in I don't I don't remember what her name was, but she was another fellow. Uh, she's a singer, and she would sing the chorus with him uh-huh. uh, for Africa. But yeah, no, it's a uh, his music is just a whole lot of fun. Very very energetic. Um, I highly recommend it. Beautiful. Um, go ahead and give it a listen. All right. Well, that wraps it up for this week. Yeah. Um, anything else we want to cover before we wrap up? I think we've touched on everything. Okay. Well, uh, I've been Andrew. I've been Lee. And this has been Whitaker Weekly. We'll see you next week.